welcome. This is the PVC Morning Dawn Study Group webcast from Padmasami Ling, the Venerable Kemper Rinpoche's Monastery and Retreat Center in New York. Uh, today we're discussing their book, The Buddhist Path, Chapter 19, which is entitled Guru Yoga. So we'll begin with our usual opening and lineage prayers, and then we'll go into this discussion. Thanks so much for joining us. So chapter 19, Guru Yoga begins on page 93 in the Buddhist path. And I'll do a summary of this chapter, then we'll go into the main point. Um, so the Venerable Kemper Rinpoche's begin by saying, All the teachings of the Buddha lead to Dzogchen, which is the pinnacle of Vajrayana. And that key opens the door to Zog the key that opens the door to Dzogchen is Guru Yoga. You should meditate on Guru Padmasambhava with a peaceful mind filled with devotion and bodhicitta. And by receiving his blessings, it will help you to realize the true nature of your own mind. They say, Guru Rinpoche completely embodies all the three jewels and three roots, all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, all the lineage masters, including your own personal teachers. Doing Guru Yoga and practicing on one Buddha, like Guru Rinpoche, is enough to achieve full enlightenment. All of the Buddhas we visualize are both real Buddhas, as well as displays of our own mind. Practicing wholeheartedly on one Buddha, you feel a strong connection to will be enough for you to achieve enlightenment. Rinpoche describe a simple yet complete way to meditate on Guru Rinpoche. First recite the seven line prayer and then recite the Vajra Guru Mantra. To do this, um, they say to do the same preparations for any sitting practice. First do three prostrations and sit with good posture. Do breath purification three times. Then visualize Guru Rinpoche in the sky in front of you as it's described in the chapter. Guru Rinpoche is made of wisdom rainbow light and is not made of flesh and bone. Take refuge and arouse bodhicitta to free all beings from suffering. Then recite the seven line prayer at least three or seven times. They say this prayer is the voice of the true nature that spontaneously arose when Guru Rinpoche was miraculously born. The twelve syllables of the Vajra Guru Mantra balance and purify the internal and external aspects of our existence, including the twelve links of interdependent origination. Even one recitation of the Vajra Guru Mantra has great benefit. Recite this mantra for as long as you have time. If you're in a hurry to see Guru Rinpoche, recite the mantra more. You can recite 21 times, 108 times, 10 malas, 100 malas, a million malas, a billion malas. Whatever you have time for, uh, with the aim of completing at least 100,000 recitations. They say the sound of the mantra is profound meditation. Uh, when you concentrate on the sound with devotion, in bodhicitta, while recognizing the emptiness nature of yourself in all forms, sounds, and awareness. 
This is the union of Shamatha and Vipassana, or the union of creation and completion stages, which purifies all inner and outer forms, sounds, and movements of mind. After reciting the mantra, receive the blessings from Guru Rinpoche as instructed in the book, and sincerely believe that all the impurities of your body, speech, and mind are completely removed, and you fully, you fully received Guru Rinpoche's blessings. Next, Guru Rinpoche dissolves into white light, which merges into your crown chakra and heart center, filling your body with wisdom light. Your body is no longer solid, but is made of pure rainbow light. Your awareness is entirely and separably merged with the wisdom mind of Guru Rinpoche and all the Buddhas. Rest in this wisdom awareness without being distracted by thoughts for as long as you have time. Conclude by dedicating the merit of your practice for the benefit of all sentient beings. Uh, the first main topic is um, on page 93, first and second paragraphs. All of the Buddha's teachings are like stair steps leading to Dzogchen, the great perfection which is the summit of the Vajrayana. The key that opens the door to Dzogchen is the practice of Guru Yoga. If you want to practice Dzogchen, you should first practice on Guru Padmasambhava, and then you will easily understand the Dzogchen teachings. When you supplicate Guru Padmasambhava with a clear and peaceful mind, filled with devotion and bodhicitta, then his blessings and those of all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will help you to realize the true nature of your mind. For people who want to do Vajrayana meditation, it is very important to practice Guru Yoga. Guru Padmasambhava represents the three jewels and the three roots, all the objects of refuge. When you meditate on him, you are not ignoring the other realized beings, because he embodies all of the Buddhas of the Ten Directions and the Three Times. In particular, he represents your personal teachers and all of the masters of the Nima and Kagyu lineages. It is not necessary to visualize all the different Buddhas. Doing Guru Yoga and practicing on one Buddha is enough to bring full enlightenment. I have a question. I just thought maybe to talk a little bit about, like in the second um, sentence, the key that opens the door to Dzogchen is the practice of Guru Yoga. And maybe just to kind of talk about, like, how is that and why is that, that Guru Yoga is really like the essential practice for the highest of the path, Dzogchen? Anyone have any thoughts about that? I think it relates back to, to really feeling that, that closeness with the teacher, particularly if you're, if you're fortunate where you're able to have a, a connection to a teacher and, you, and you're able to connect to that wisdom mind and recognizing how they're really the emanation of all the beautiful qualities and all that beautiful potential, really, of this precious human life, but also, you know, the nature of the mind, all of those beautiful qualities, really reflecting on that, feeling that closeness, and then, you know, what, having that connection and that desire to just mirror all of those qualities, seeing them in yourself, and really connecting down to that, to that pith understanding, you know, what, I mean, what else do you want? Mm. You know? <laughs> but I don't know what anyone else thinks. Hmm? I want to say, I just had one thought, which is just that, like, these are lineage teachings, too, that come from, like, mm -hmm. thousands of years of realized beings who practice that, engage in the teachings, and Guru Padmasambhava is a living Buddha, like we said in the last, like we saw in the last chapter living Buddha who continuously manifests and emanates and appears in visions or in actuality. And, and so, like Rinpoche has often said that the lineage blessing is like the... Uh, lineage is like a power line, and the lineage blessings is electricity that goes through the power line. So when you connect to that, I guess, with the, with the proper motivation, then that... You're, you're not just making, you know, we're not just making something up just kind of out of the blue, but it's just like a... And then like what Lodra was saying too, because the, because devotion, well, devotion is so essential, you know, like Rupertie is always saying. Yeah. Devotion is like the most profound practice, you know, as far as when you connect with that, they see your mind is really so close to the 
natural state. Even if you didn't recognize the natural state, but that quality of openness and love and appreciation and joy and gratitude and is courage and commitment is the essence of the whole path. You know? Yeah, I was thinking too about how you know what guru yoga is is merging with the guru's mind, and so that's so the guru is like a a link, you know, it, that in terms of what that realized mind is, then you start to be able to kind of recognize that because you see it in your teacher, and uh, so then there's some connection there in terms of um, starting to experience it within yourself. Mm. Yeah, which kind of is similar to what Loder was saying about the mirroring. That happens, you know, because of recognizing something, it's almost like you you can't recognize something without at least seeing a little bit in yourself. And this is really beautiful, kind of. It's a beautiful process, I think. That kind of little bit, little bit, kind of glimpsing, <laughs> glimpsing, glimpsing. Very profound. I mean, it is like it is kind of a speechless in a way. It's kind of speechless. I mean, I think a bidu. I mean, I'm just more sign of thing comes to mind. Like as long as we're not realized beings, then we're holding on to things. Then we're grasping onto something because we're in grasping mind. So in that case. And we're in grasping mind, then the best thing we can possibly grasp onto is an enlightened being. Because mm -hmm. everything an enlightened being is going to do for us is going to be for our benefit and everyone's benefit. So it's the, I mean, and it's very clear in terms of taking refuge, like, like the Buddha Dharma Sangha and the Three Roots. And uh, I mean, the, the, the Lama are the great, these great wisdom beings, like, really fully embody these qualities, like Guru Rinpoche, of course. And that if we're going to rely on something, then that's the most direct way to, to manifest those qualities ourselves, or to see them in ourselves, at least. So then we directly are connecting with, and I mean, this has so much to do with sincerity, and really seeing those beautiful qualities, and also renouncing, or being larger than the small, narrow ways we can also be, to really renounce these more narrow ways of our mind and all this doubt and hesitation and just really kind of having full confidence to lean into the that it's possible there are these wisdom beings and that we have that in ourselves too and please come help me realize that and then in the end I mean it's of course that we're not relying on an external being I mean that's very clear in the teachings of like emptiness from Sutra Mahayana up I think that, but as long as we need to rely on things, because our mind is holding things, then that's the best thing we can rely on. And in the end, like, they were not needing to rely on anything. I mean, the Buddhas don't, because there's not anything out there. There's not anything in here. It's just your awareness or something. But so it's like seems like a very direct way to do that. And it seems infallible in the sense of if, if you're really connecting with a Buddha, an enlightened master, that's all that they can do is help all beings. I mean, that's there's nothing blocking them, their nature from doing that. And then to really leap over that division we have between ourselves being separate from all of this, from everything, there's a separation, and just to mingle, like Anne said, to really have mind merge with mind yeah. as best we can, even for a moment. seems so fascinating how he, he like, particularly the way that Lokyense was treating Guru Yoga was it wasn't you know just something on the on the cushion is you know he was talking about Guru Yoga becoming this car, this mm -hmm. part of, of your daily life where like and if you're walking uphill you're you're visualizing your teacher above your head and you're while you're also making the aspiration you know may I 
may I, uh, you know, carry all sentient beings from the hell realms, you know, to liberation. Or if you're going downhill, you know, may I go to the hell realms to liberate all sentient beings, you know. You know, open a, a door and, you know, may I open the door to liberation. You know, the, imbuing every, every part of your, of your daily activity with that with the Guru Yoga, but also tying it into the, to the real essence of Guru Yoga, really tapping into the aspirations, those good qualities, really, you know, making your heart tender about all of those things. I just really thought it was, it was really, really something beautiful, you know, particularly, because I, I think with all, with all the things we, we've been discussing here, I mean, of course it's not, you know, things that, it's just for the, the, the cushion or for the, for the meditation room or anything like that, it's, you know, where is the, you know, where does it, where does it make your t heart tender in everything you do? You know, and of course, with, with Guru Yoga, those who've, who've practiced it enough, of course, it doesn't seem like that much of a difference because they, you know, they, they get it, they understand that, you know, it's, that, that blessing just carries into everything in, in that sense of, you know, it's, it's always there, nature of mind's always there, all these beautiful qualities are always there, but, you know, I th for those of us who are still, uh, it's still stubborn, you know, <laughs> it's good to have those little reminders to carry through the day. I thought it was really beautiful. Of course, it was very helpful that there's such a long walk to get to the mail, so that gives me a lot of time to practice going to the Hell Realms and back. But <laughs> <laughs> about Guru Yoga that's really striking is that if, I mean at least, I think we can all say this, when we're actually in a state of mind that's actually devoted, that's inspired, that's like so kind of just like freshly engaged with the teachings and like the this preciousness of the opportunity and how amazing it is that the, these great beings, these teachers that we've received these teachings and they help us with so many things and they're just relentlessly available and so compassionate like that when we're actually in that's even a moment of mind it's just so clear like how beneficial that is to the practice like mm -hmm. how it becomes real like that impermanence become you don't want to waste time this is so special or the bodhicitta be, it just all becomes self-evident when that devotion is really strong in that moment um, and you can see, I mean, at least, it's just how it just all kind of clicks. Even if you're just devoted for, you know, you read some inspiring thing and you're devoted for a minute or five minutes. It's just, the Dharma just makes more sense. I mean, all the things that block us and we, you know, we think we're so bad or so lazy or we're so great and we don't need it. Or just all the ways we can kind of go around the point. That in that moment of actually being devoted, that it's just really so strong and then here's like the practice where that's what we're trying to do all the time is just be in this totally inspired vulnerable like welcoming receptive state to the blessings and to our own like nature being there mm -hmm. so while i think there's a lot of technical things we can say about it too i think it's also like really obvious if we're just in like when we're in that mm -hmm. devoted awareness it's just it works like the practice is not a burden. It's like, I want to do this so much, you know, until we get all caught in something and then whatever. Like we get caught and we need to do practice and everything. Yeah, and when you think of, when you think of everything that we've gone through in samsara, even just in this lifetime, you know, and, and how, how much benefit have we gotten from normal, mundane activities, and how have we come out of suffering and realized uh, that our nature is enlightened? Not that much. Maybe, I mean, you know, it's like, not too much, but when you meet a teacher, like, that, that really embodies, that, that is the Dharma, you know, like, absolute Guru Padma Sambhava, they embody that quality. And you actually make a connection, if you think about it, in the whole vastness of all our lifetimes, and even in this one, finally we're connecting with someone who embodies, who really gets it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and is totally dedicated to benefiting others. That's the only thing they want to do, because that's their whole, you know, fully actualize their nature. 
and you see them just selflessly, you know, like day in and day out, like totally benefiting beings, and that's their greatest wish and intention, and like you make a connection with somebody who is the teachings, and they are Padmasavava, you know, from the, on the absolute level, they are, they totally recognize that nature, and they're just, they're, 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 what they most want is for you to recognize that, your mind, their mind are the same, and Padma, Guru Padmasambhava's mind is the same. It's just like a total beacon of light that just cuts through everything, you know, of the whole darkness of all these struggles of trying to make things work that are never going to work, you know, and trying to like, I mean, not to, it's just like, it's a total, like, you won the lottery, you know. If you make contact with a qualified teacher and come in contact with the teachings, the teachings always say, it's like going to the island of wish-fulfilling jewels, and you have everything that you've ever wanted right in your hand, you know. They say, if you don't achieve enlightenment based on that, you know, then what sense does that make at all, you know? It's just beautiful, you know, when you think about it. It's like you totally, your samsara is ending for you. When you meet a qualified teacher, when you hear the teaching, you hear the dharma that they embody and that passed on this line of wisdom realization, you know? It's literally like, for you, samsara is like, at the very end, you know, I mean, we should see it that way, you know, and I mean, if we do approach it that way, then it's like, there's nothing standing in our way, because all the obstacles are totally dispelled by connecting with that teacher, like, through Guru Yoga, you said mm -hmm. too, and even if your life is cut short, and even if you die tomorrow, you know, then who cares, you know, if you, if you are in that, if you are doing that, you know, you're connecting with that, and your life is meaningful, you know, you're making it meaningful in that moment, then that's what more could you do, yeah. you know? I think it's also beautiful too, especially in Vajrayana, that, I mean, it was just that, the possibility of achieving enlightenment in a single lifetime, and if we think about how much karma we have that has to be purified in order for that to be possible, that there's definitely going to be a lot of karma that's going to come up in that lifetime, that's going to have to be worked with or dealt with in a way where we don't continue that karma. So here we have a method that like can just blaze through or just really go through all these turbulent things that have to come up in order to become enlightened in a single lifetime. I mean, in order to do it in any kind of a short time. Like there's just these, obs I mean, just obstacles, hindrances, crises, imbalances, like all those karma things. We'll just, here we have a method, like the way of most directly going to how we can best deal with all those situations, even the good times. Like it is to recognize our nature that these things are just movements of our nature and to stay grounded in that. And then here you go yoga, it's, that's what it's all about. And so it becomes the essence of all of these practices of all the other nandra practices and like they all really begin with that like seeing that recognizing that nature and so it's kind of powerful it's indirect so I'll go to the next uh, we'll do the next summary thing and the next question uh, Kemba Rinpoche is continue by saying, there are many ways to meditate and they all require concentration. In this practice, you can concentrate on each syllable, circling clockwise, which will transform your ordinary speech into Vajra speech. You also need to apply mindfulness, which means you're aware of what your mind is doing. In Vajrayana practice, it's very important to establish and grow a personal connection with your Lama and Guru Padmasambhava. Guru Mache will help you realize the nature of your mind, and your Lama exemplifies the realization gained by the practice. Um, when you connect with your teacher, you have an auspicious situation similar to that of being directly receiving teachings from Guru Mache as one of his disciples. <coughs> Uh, this comes from page 96, the last two paragraphs. Uh, there are many ways to meditate, but no matter which technique you use, you need to apply concentration. This involves keeping the mind on the object of focus. Also, during meditation, you need to apply mindfulness to watch what your mind is doing 
as a support for your concentration. This is the best, this is the basic instruction for beginning your daily practice. When you do Vajrayana practice, it is very important to establish a personal connection with the Lama and with Guru Padmasambhava. By connecting with Guru Padmasambhava, you receive his assistance in understanding the true nature of the mind. Doing Guru Yoga practice also brings a very close connection to your personal teacher, who exemplifies the realization gained by the practice. When you connect with a personal teacher, you have an auspicious situation similar to that of Guru Padmasambhava's 25 disciples, all of whom became enlightened by following the instructions of their teacher. <coughs> What do you think, Lyle? <laughs> I don't know. I, th I think, I mean, the, the first part of there in this section is kind of talking about what Anne brought up, too, just as far as that link of the way our concentration kind of gives in a way for our, our focus and something in our devotion. I'm not sure what my thoughts are about that, besides just it's a big one. <laughs> but I did have another, sorry, as you were reading, I did have a thought. But if someone else has something, I'll bring it up. <laughs> okay, how does, this, how does this Guru Yoga... So Buddhism is a non-theistic tradition. Yeah. And there's a lot of theistic traditions. So how is this Guru Yoga not a theistic, um, like supplication to some to someone greater than you, or more powerful, or something, and you're asking for the thing, you know, right. what's the difference there between Guru Yoga, how can we have Guru Yoga and still be non-theistic? Because from an outsider's perspective, it, it may look just like you're saying, From it, it may look theistic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it may look like we're praying to this external deity. So what are we doing, or how is it different? I think we're trying to recognize the nature of our own mind, we're trying to bend we're trying to, you know, we're also hopefully applying the instructions and the meditation on, like you mentioned earlier, on emptiness and the great openness that, that fundamentally, like even in the instructions, you know, Guru Rinpoche is not, is a, is a light, light body, there's nothing to grasp, it's not ordinary. And then further in the instructions, usually, I mean, we might be in our ordinary form too, but a lot of the instructions are also recognizing everything is mm -hmm. like kind of in that state, like a rainbow in the sky. So kind of that fundamental, really important point that there, there isn't a substantially existing someone. We're trying to come to a fuller understanding of that. And then with the, you know, these blessings, like the, the nature of our mind, like it says too, it is inconceivable. It's beyond grasping. And then just how the guru in, embodies that realization is an appearance to our mind of the expressive quality of that realization to turn our own minds and all beings towards realizing their true nature. And that inconceivable nature and inconceivable kind of realization, I think that's a lot of what's why, like that point of devotion and like opening our mind and heart, like we can't, you know, there's like no formula we could really write out that describes how blessings work or what blessings are, you know, besides, I mean, in that, just in that sense of like, it's inconceivable, what we're opening to is in, inconceivable beyond any map we can make, but we have these kind of guidelines and like, a really structured, reliable set of lineage instructions that help, according to our capacities, to connect and focus our mind, like in that direction, usher our mind toward that. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. Yeah, I would sort of focus in in terms of what Lai was saying in particular about how recognition that Guru Mache is empty mm -hmm. and that we're empty, and the whole sort of all the foundational teachings that we have as a basis for this of knowing that we're going beyond uh, perceiver and perceive that kind of mm -hmm. dualistic mind that we're not thinking that he's really some real guy right. up there and uh, so it, it really is different in terms of the internal understanding. Mm -hmm. Is he, uh, 
in one way to put it, is he like a an image of our Nuke Sim, original mind or fundamental mind? Would you say that, or or is blessings coming from ourselves, <laughs> from from that non conceptual place of ourselves, or or what? That's just a thought. I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, in here they say both, right? Yeah. Even in this chapter. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what I was getting at, too, at that point. I mean, it just seems to that inconceivable thing. I mean, yes, there's things we can say that maybe are true. <laughs> but like that, it's like, yes, then yes. <laughs> but in terms of, like, just yeah. specifically what we're saying, yeah. where, where are the blessings coming from? Are, are they really, isn't that what you were saying? Yeah, I was thinking, I mean... Is it, is it really coming from the nature of our mind? Are we really kind of blessing ourselves? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's sort of... Yeah, well, that's, that's just the theory. That's that's well, the well, yeah. well, I also thought, too, they mentioned in this chapter that where are the Buddhas? They are, there are actual Buddhas right. that do actually exist, you know, in the universe, like Guru Pama Sambhava, but also it's a, a display.